title I gave for the sermon today is Living a Life of Gratefulness. Turn with me to Ephesians chapter 5, verse 20. One verse, Ephesians, Ephesians 5, 20. Give thanks always and for everything to God, the Father, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, living a life of gratefulness. This is our Thanksgiving week. I'm sure that all of us are making plans for our turkey, ham, casserole, sweet potato with uh, marshmallows and pecan pies, and I love pecan pies, and uh, whatnot. Everything, right? We spread the table, corn, Green beans, don't forget all that. But many people probably may not have the kind of Thanksgiving that they used to have. It's a little different this year. Regardless, when people gather around the table, hold hands and pray, give thanks to God, some of them probably give thanks to God because that's what they do, not knowing the deep meaning of why we should give thanks to God. For the benefit of those who may not know the reason why we celebrate Thanksgiving in the United States, and for those who may have forgotten, I want to kind of remind you what happened in the year 1620. I love history. That's when, on December uh, no, I take it back. November the 11th, Mayflower landed in Plymouth Rock, Massachusetts. How many people traveled in that first ship that came from Europe? 102. Half of them died. Some of them died on their way here, and some of them died after they got here because of the harsh winter. And only 53 survived, according to the documented history. If you you know, if you really want to know the history, you got to go to the Library of Congress. Sometimes our history is skewed. They don't tell you the truth. The truth of the matter is 53 survived, and the very first Thanksgiving was celebrated in 1621. And that's when the survivors got together with Native Americans. Some called them Red Indians, some called them American Indians, but they were Native Americans. And they had a wonderful celebration of giving thanks to God Almighty. It's not a turkey day, folks. <laughs> it is not a American Indian Day or any other thing you would want to call. It was a Thanksgiving day, giving thanks to the Lord because God provided for their needs and God protected them and, uh, and God preserved them through the harsh winter. And the American Indians pretty much gave them what they had to do, cook turkey, corn, and I believe they had three days of celebration. And if you read the uh, Mayflower impact of the first families that landed here, you would hear the word to the glory of God. You would read the word because God has given us this life, we want to thank the Lord, praise you. Read the history. And then in 1789, George Washington, after the Revolutionary War, he declared three days of celebration in December, not in November. It was cold, but then he said, we need to celebrate three days, Thanksgiving. And then it was after the Civil War, Abraham Lincoln said, we need to have a day in November. And then, of course, the law came the last Thursday in November. November, we're going to have this uh, Thanksgiving celebration. It is the day we need to give thanks to the Lord for all the good things. Three things. Because He protects, He provides, and He preserves. That was the original meaning of the original family that landed here. I want to add one more thing. When they came here, the only literature they had in their hand was the printed King James Bible. King James Bible was printed in 1611, eight years before they took the voyage across uh, Atlantic. So the only text they had was the Bible, King James Bible. 
And that was the text used in school system. That was a text used in judicial system. That was a text used in the government. That was a text used in the first colonies. And that was a text. That's it. And we took this out today. What a sad thing. That was the first Thanksgiving based on the Bible. There we are, giving thanks to the Lord. This year it's going to be different. And our governor, he gave his proclamation that we can't get together more than 10 people. That rules out our yearly 25 outside, 25 outside okay? And, so uh, that's what, 20, Thanksgiving's outside this year. Outside this year, the weather is good. And if it's not, we probably have to stay inside. And I might have to turn this one off. It's going to chime in all the time. So I did. Okay. And, and we're going to celebrate this Thanksgiving. It's going to be a little different uh, than usual. Thinking of Thanksgiving, living a life of gratefulness, I think of four kinds of people. It's a little humorous, but I want to get it out. The first kind of people... They're constant complainers. They can't find good in anything. You try to do good all the time, they can't find good in anything. I heard a story of uh, a, a wife told her husband, honey, this is Thanksgiving morning. I don't want you to get up from bed. I want you to just take rest. Just be there in bed. I'll bring you breakfast. So she asked, honey, what do you want? And the husband said, well, I want two slices of toast, bread toast, and uh, I want bacon, and uh, I want sausage, and I want some, some potatoes. And uh, don't forget, I want two eggs, one sunny side up, the other one is scrambled. Yes, honey, I'll bring it to you. I had a big pot of coffee, I'll bring it to you. Husband was just laying on his bed, and the wife, came with the tray of all that the husband ordered. And then he had a sour face. And the wife looked at him and said, what's wrong? Well, you scrambled the wrong egg. <laughs> <laughs> so the constant complainers, regardless of how good you want to do, they always have something to point out. They can never be thankful. The second kind they are outright ingratitude people. They complain. They do not only they, they don't complain. I should say the ingratitude people. They don't complain, but they think they are entitled to everything. Mentality and give me, give me, give me. I want to get all I want to get. I don't want to be grateful. They won't complain. The plain old ingre ungrateful people. Entitlement mentality. Ingratitude. Then the third one is probably. Um, that's by everybody in America on Thanksgiving Day. They give thanks to the Lord for the food, for the shelter, for the cars they drive, for the houses they have, all, all the good things, um, which, is, which is okay for obvious blessings. But when, when one of these are taken away from them, then look at their attitude. It would be different. They don't have food if they don't have anything, if they don't have a good car or a home or anything like that. Their attitude would... I don't want to use the word, smell bad, okay? And uh, that's the kind of people, it's, it's kind of obvious Thanksgiving. But the fourth kind is what I want to really talk to you about. Always be grateful, always. Ephesians 5.20, I want to read that again. Give thanks always and for everything to God the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. This being Thanksgiving, I chose this topic because I want to, Tell our people to enjoy the holiday, but also enjoy with the true meaning of Thanksgiving. It's, it's a story again. Uh, a man, a farmer, heard about a barn, seed barn, that the devil has. So he said, I want to go and see the seed barn the devil has. So this man went over there. It was neatly arranged, all the seeds in barrels and with labels on. And then he saw the biggest barrel of all. And this man couldn't help but go near the barrel and saw the name of the seed. It was called discouragement. So when he read that discouragement, he asked the devil, how come this is the biggest barrel you got? 
It's got the name discouragement. The devil said, you know, I can sow that seed anywhere and get people discouraged that I can get whatever I want from them. And I will do the same thing with Christians too. In fact, I would start with them. If I discourage Christians, I can get anything that I want from them. But here's one thing. There's one type of Christians that I cannot sow the seed of discouragement. They're called grateful Christians. They're always thankful I can't sow the seed of discouragement. They would never be discouraged. It's a nice story. That's a lot of meaning. Give thanks always for all things, meaning perpetual thanksgiving. There's no time limit. It doesn't mean we have to give thanks to God once a year. Of course, we're reminded thanksgiving. But then we should give thanks to God. Psalmist David says, here's the reason why we should praise God perpetually. 58, 68, Psalm 68, 19. Blessed be the Lord who daily bears us up. Who daily bears us up. That means he cares for you. He preserves you every day. And then here's another one. Lamentations 3, 22 and 23. Lamentation 3, 22 and 23. That steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. Which means... 365 days a year, 24-7. It never ceases. His mercies never come to an end. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. God is faithful. He never ceases to bless His children. That's what the Bible says. So thanksgiving should never cease because God never ceases to bless His people. No matter what happens, we're called to give thanks to God. But then while I was preparing this sermon, especially keeping this year in the rear view mirror of COVID-19, I came up with four things that people find it difficult to give thanks to the Lord. The first thing, when a Christian is hurt, he or she finds it very difficult. You know, if, if you talk to a person on the phone or in, in person and say, how are you doing? They would say, I'm okay. You can't go past that word, I'm okay. If truth be told, if you go a little further, you would know, not all, some people may have some hidden hurts. Some of the trials and tribulations they went through hurt them. Some Christians are trapped in their own hearts because of hurts in life. They try to do everything possible to escape the pain, but they're not able to. It's there, deep-seated. Probably many that are listening today have the same problem of deep-seated hurts. When you let the deep-seated hurts, like losing a loved one, broken relationship, or failure in your workplace, or moral failures, or whatever it might be, most recent hurt, or something that happened when you are a child or growing up, unless you deal with that hurt, it is not possible to give thanks to God always. That's going to haunt you. Why unresolved hurts haunt Christians? When you do not resolve any hurts in your life, then you become very resentful. Resentment would lead to regrets. Regrets would lead to remorse. And at the end, you're not able to give thanks. I want you to know, Paul is writing this. Give thanks to God always from the prison. If anyone is hurt, he should have been hurt sitting in the dungeon, thinking of all the good things that he has done for the gospel. He should have been the one I am resentful here in the prison. 
I have this remorse feeling. I have regrets. I should have remained to be a Pharisee. Why should I be in this prison? I'm not used to prison. I'm used to sending people to prison, not being in the prison. Paul never had those frustrations. He said, give thanks to God from the prison. Lamentations 3, 22 through 24. I read that, but I want to give you the preface to it. Because of the Lord's great love, we're not consumed. Micah 7.18. Micah 7.18. Who is a God like you, who pardons sin and forgives the transgressions of remnant of his inheritance? You do not stay angry forever, but delight to show mercy. You will again have compassion on us. You will tread our sins underfoot and hurl all iniquities in the depths of the sea. My kind of saying is that do not have resentments of any kind because God puts it away. He tramples, he tread on our sins under his feet. He has compassion. We're not consumed. He's not an angry God. I want you to take you back to some of the dark valleys that probably you went, uh, came through in your life that caused you to be hurtful today. Be thankful to God always. I love missionary biographies. I've been to some of the tombs of missionaries. That's my dream. One day I want to go and visit as many tombs or places of mission work as possible. I've been to William Carey's Cemetery in Calcutta, India. I've been to David Livingston's Chapel in Congo, Africa. And I, I've been to Amy Carmichael, who worked in South India for 56 years as a missionary. Now I'm bringing her up today because of this reason. She had an accident, damaged both her legs. She was bedridden until the same she died for 20 long years. Amy Carmichael. Amy Carmichael's ministry was to rescue the little children sold into temple prostitution. She did a great job, preached the gospel. Imagine the way that she was doing. And all of a sudden she got hurt because of an accident, bedridden for 20 long years. It was during those 20 years she wrote 40 books, 20 years, 40 books, two books a year. And one of the books she wrote was based on Romans 8.28, and she gave the title, A Wise Master Never Wastes His Servant's Time. Beautiful title. A Wise Master Never Wastes His Servant's Time. Amy Carmichael learned to give thanks to God even during those hurtful years, 20 years. I don't know, maybe you're hurt. You're not able to give thanks to God always. You are resentful, a lot of regrets in life. Maybe you have this feeling of remorse. That is stopping you from giving thanks to God meaningfully. Perhaps you're like those people who regularly give thanks to God because of the roof over their heads and the food they eat, the vehicle they drive, and all the regular things. But deep within, you're saying you're okay, but you're not. You're hurt. Give it to God. His compassion fail not. God will turn your hurt into something beautiful like Amy Carmichael. Secondly, when a Christian is sorrowful, he cannot rejoice always. Philippians 4.4, 4, Paul is saying, rejoice in the Lord always. We all know that again, and I say rejoice. Rejoice. Well, you tell that to Mary Magdalene on the day that she went to the tomb of the Lord Jesus. I was just imagining, let's say that Paul had this, Paul wrote this afterwards. So let's say this this was there already. Rejoice the Lord always and again I say rejoice. Someone walked over to Mary Magdalene 
as she was by the tomb of the Lord Jesus. Rejoice, Mary Magdalene. Again, I say rejoice. Mary would look at you. Are you crazy? Here am I looking for my Lord's body. He was, he was treated bad, falsely accused. They crucified him. And I came in the morning to embalm the body. And I can't find the body. She was crying. See, uncontrolled sorrow would lead to frustration. She was so frustrated because her sorrow put a barrier between her understanding of what God said and the situation that she was in. She was not able to be joyful. And there are people like that. Job said, but a man is born to trouble as the sparks fly upward. We all go through troublesome times. But I want to give you what Jesus did that morning with Mary Magdalene. The Lord understood the barrier that was between Mary and him. She was so sorrowful, she was crying. The first barrier the Lord wants to break is this. And you were reading the scripture when you read the gospels. The Lord asked her first, why are you crying? The resurrected Lord. That's a funny question, ain't it? God should know why she was crying. But the reason why God asked her, why are you crying? Just for her to recognize the kind of barriers she put because of frustration. There's a sorrow in life. That created frustration, and frustration blocked her mind, her heart, from reality. So she was crying. It's okay to cry. It's okay to be sorrowful. She could not rejoice that morning, but God broke the barrier. The first barrier God ever broke is this. He said, I'm alive. This is, this is he. Mary called her by name, which means I'm alive. If you're sorrowful because someone passed away or sorrowful that you're crying, the first thing should come to your mind is that God is alive. He's not dead. The second barrier, if somebody died in your family and then you're so sad this year, I know that I've done a few funerals from last year to this year. I know this year the Boobies family and it's going to be pretty difficult for them. I know to some extent even the Rogers family. And, uh, uh, and then others that we know bury their loved ones, it's going to be a difficult year. Not because of COVID-19, because there's a chair empty in your home. There's somebody died in your house. Most recently, I buried uh, Mr. Richardson, Lauren Mullen's dad. And I'll come to let's say the next point. I say that horrific death for another point. But now, because of all these things, and you, you, you're so frustrated. And God said, after that, even before that, to the disciples, I'm going to prepare a place for you. So there is a prepared place for prepared Christians. If you know God is the way, truth, and the life, and God said, I'm going to have many mansions, that should comfort all of you who lost your loved ones this year. Whether to COVID-19 or natural causes, or because of dreadful disease that took your loved one away from you. There's a place in heaven. The third barrier that God wants to break in Mary Magdalene's life is that, Mary, I want you to know that I'm in control. Turn with me to Isaiah 52, 7. Isaiah 52, 7. It's a beautiful word, Bible verse here. How beautiful upon the mountains are the feet of whom who brings good news, who publishes peace, who brings good news of happiness, who publishes salvation, who says to Zion, your God reigns, your God reigns, our God reigns, believe it, our God reigns, rest in him, our God reigns, rejoice, our God reigns, relax, our God reigns, he breaks the barrier of all the sorrows that we endure in life, Mary, I am alive, look at me, all of a sudden her tears were gone, her crying, Dried up because she realized that her sorrow was taken away by the resurrected Lord Jesus. 
If you're unable to give thanks because of the sorrow, have these promises. He broke the barriers. Barrier of death, he gives us eternal life, and he is in absolute control. He's a sovereign God. Believe, rest, and relax. When you do that, you can rejoice. Give thanks to God. Thirdly, the third reason why when a Christian can't probably give thanks is because they're lonely. Have you, have you ever felt lonely in your life? And I'm sure you have. You could be in the middle of thousands of people yet be lonely. Loneliness is of the heart. Was Jesus lonely? Several times. He was lonely in the Garden of Gethsemane. He asked the, the disciples to, to wait and pray, and they did not. He was all alone, praying to the Father in heaven, in the Garden. He was lonely. Jesus wept, but his disciples slept. And he prayed. His disciples snored. He was filled with spirit. And the disciples were filled with flesh. See the difference? What makes people lonely? It's because those people were supposed to be with you. They don't care. They're sleeping. And those people who are supposed to be praying with you, they're snoring. That means they give nothing to what you're going through. Just like what the disciples did. The Lord was in the spirit. They were in the flesh. He was lonely. That's why the Lord said, come unto me. I know what loneliness means. And I want to give you peace that world cannot take it away. And I would have my peace in you. He was lonely in the garden of Gethsemane. And he was lonely. He was going through the trial. Peter denied the Lord. And he was all by himself accused. You know, people feel lonely when they are falsely accused. No one seemed to understand me. I'm being accused and standing in the trial in Annas and Caiaphas' house. No one seemed to understand, even my own. Look at this guy, Peter. He was outside. He, he's going to deny me. Obviously, he denied the Lord Jesus. He was alone. And then the Lord was alone again on the cross. We all know on the cross he shouted, My God, my God, why you have forsaken me? See, loneliness is a very, what can I say, draining thing. When you are lonely, you feel that no one is beside you. No one is standing up for you. The worst form of loneliness is thinking that even God has forsaken you. Because you're going through difficult times and all of a sudden you say, God, where are you? Just like the Lord Jesus cried on the cross, why you have forsaken me? God the Father did not forsake the Lord Jesus. You and I know that. It's because of the loneliness the Lord suffered from Thursday night. You see how it progresses? The first day in the Garden of Gethsemane, he was all alone. His disciples slept. They were snoring. They didn't care. They were in the flesh. And then he was taken to Caiaphas' house all night long. He interrogated all night long. And no one was with him. He was all by himself. And no one stood up for him because they were all scared. And then he was taken to Pilate's place. Again, he was all alone. No one would ever say, release him, except one woman who came to her husband, Pilate's wife. Don't do anything. But again, he wouldn't listen. He was lonely. I don't know whether Jesus even knew that Pilate's wife said like that. And on the cross, he was all alone. If you're not able to give thanks to God because you're lonely, perhaps that your friends let you down, your co-workers let you down, your family let you down, your siblings let you down, your parents let you down, your children let you down, you don't have a job. There's something in your heart you feel so lonely. You're not able to turn to the right or left. But I want to tell you, the Lord knows. 
he was alone. He was lonely. Therefore, give thanks to God. He understands. And finally, when a misfortune hits a Christian, when a misfortune hits a Christian, that Christian may not be able to give thanks always. Now let's talk about Lixie. Lix, Lix, Lixie Helker, Shelly and I knew her right from kindergarten. Little girl. The true story is that she had dysfunctional family, therefore grandparents took this baby under their wings and raised her, sent her to a Christian school, paid for her education. Lexi and her boyfriend, another girl and her boyfriend, all four, went to Myrtle Beach. I was told that they did not tell anybody they were going there. They lied. They were going to spend a weekend together. Had a fatal accident. Three teenagers, all 18, died on the spot. Lexi hung on to her life for about 11 days. And Lexi died. She was barely 18. Saturday a week ago was her funeral, as you know, that it was a heartbreaking thing for me to be there to see many teenagers attending the funeral. Now many would think, why would God allow this misfortune? And I want to read the scripture. Because sometimes misfortune would take the joy away cannot be thankful. Sometimes you would even tend to blame those teenagers and blame those die. I don't know whether you would uh, whether you had a chance to look at the scripture this way, turn with me, because I want to show you something you probably never looked at this way. Luke chapter 13. I want to read that. Luke 13. Jesus was talking about a misfortune. And I'm going to read that to you. It's an amazing scripture. You know, we, we gloss over that. Don't go into that deeply. But let me read that to you. Here it is. Luke 13. There was some present at that very time who told him, the Lord Jesus, about the Galileans whose blood Pilate had mingled with their sacrifice. Now, if you read the story that there were some Galilean Christians, they were worshiping God. What Pilate did... He sent troops to kill them, kill the Galileans from worshiping God and take their blood to Pilate. And Pilate was going to mix that blood and give animal sacrifice. Keep that in mind. There was another misfortune. There was a colonnade collapsed and fell on 18 people. Let me continue. He answered them, do you think that these Galileans are worse sinners than all the other Galileans because they suffered in this way? Now I tell you, but unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. Or those 18 of whom the tower in Siloam fell and killed them. Two incidences. One innocent Galileans killed by Pilate and the blood was taken to the heathen temple and Pilate mixed that with other blood for animal sacrifice. And then there was a collapse of the tower in, in Siloam, Siloam in the outskirts of Jerusalem. And as you know, Siloam was also a place where they had a, a cistern, the pool. Remember Siloam? And it was right next to it. And all of a sudden, it collapsed and killed 18 innocent people standing there. The Lord Jesus courted those two misfortunes here. And then he said... Don't you think that you're better off than them that got killed? So I, I gave a title to this, Misfortunes, according to this scripture, explains that God uses misfortunes as his bullhorn, megaphone. What he's saying, I want you to repent. It doesn't mean that they, you're better off than those that died. 
God never talked anything bad about those that died in Galilee or in Solomon. God never mentioned them. Oh, they're sinners. That's why he killed them. He said, it's a warning to you. Repent. We have to live a life of repentance. Daily repentance. When misfortune hits, it's a warning. It could have been you. That's what the Lord says. It could have been you there in Salawam. It could have been you as a Galilean. But you're fortunate you're here. Repent. Beautiful scripture. Unless you repent, the Lord said you will likewise perish. Repentance is the bottom line. COVID-19, I lost a good pastor friend of mine, Samuel Dave Mason. He went to school with me, he became a director of mission, so to speak, planted many, many churches, Baptist churches. COVID-19 took him away. Every time I take a team to India, he was the prime translator, a good man. And I know some of you lost your loved ones in your own family. But those are misfortunes. Not just death. Perhaps you lost your business. The COVID-19 took your small business away. Perhaps you don't have a job. All these are misfortunes. And I want to emphasize again, misfortunes are God's megaphone. That's God's bullhorn saying that, hey, repent! Doesn't mean that we are holy than those that perish from COVID-19. We're not. We're sinners. But live with a heart of repentance every day. Now we're closing. Since we're going to have Thanksgiving this week. The true meaning of Thanksgiving is coming together, giving thanks to God for His provision, His protection, and His preservation. And when you do that, Give thanks to God in all circumstances. Remember, resentment should be replaced if you're hurt because God is compassionate. His compassion fail not. Remember that when you're sorrowful, like Mary Magdalene, let God break all those barriers. Death was won on the cross. Perhaps you're lonely. Remember, the Lord was lonely. He understands you. Maybe there was a misfortune in your family. Never expected something would ever happen in your family this year. I can only imagine Lexi's grandparents and others this year. And we understand, you know, death is sad in any, anyone's life. But for a 17 and 11 months old kid, it's hard. But remember, these are warnings for Christians to be thankful and have a heart of repentance. Again, live a life of gratefulness. Always give thanks to God. And may God bless our celebration of Thanksgiving this week. Let's bow our heads and pray together. Dear Lord, I don't know how many people are hurt Perhaps they're hurting because of their sin, their failures. May they come to the Lord Jesus. Lord, there may be Christians hurting so much of resentment in their hearts, regrets of things that happened in their lives. But Lord, I pray you will remove those regrets, resentments. May they give thanks always. Lord, I pray for those Christians that are sorrowful like Mary Magdalene. Nothing would ever make sense because frustration sets in. She was crying. But the Lord said, I'm alive. Thank you for the living Lord Jesus. Thank you for the eternal life. Thank you for heaven. Thank you that you won the war on the cross of Calvary and gave us the same thing that you went through, resurrection. I know there are people 
sorrowful this year. But Lord, I pray that you would break those barriers. May they catch the glimpse of the resurrected Lord Jesus who said, come unto me. He is the way, the truth, and the life. And Lord, I know there are so many folks that are lonely. I don't know the reason why they're lonely. You know. But there are ways that people become lonely. You went through yourself. But one thing is certain. Our God reigns. Help us to back on it. You are in absolute control. But I know there are many misfortunes in the life of many people that I know. Lord, we are no way better than them. For some reason, you spared our lives. Oh Lord, I pray that we will repent of our sins. Take these as a warning to all of us. God uses them as a megaphone. Lord, I pray that we will learn to give thanks to God always. May this Thanksgiving be a time of true thanksgiving of the first families landed in Plymouth Rock. Yes, we have many, many limitations this year. COVID-19 has put a lot of limitations, but help us to be thankful to you always. That's what you expect Christians to do, to live, to live a life of gratefulness. Forgive us of our sins. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Give thanks to the Lord and have a wonderful Thanksgiving. Whether you're indoor with 10 people, outdoor with 25 people, enjoy the turkey, ham, and all the goodies. Have a good Thanksgiving. We'll see you all next Sunday. God bless you. Bye-bye.